with China and India getting small amounts, uh, and you'll see China also getting some of its oil uh, by land. Now that oil by land in 2006 was primarily going by truck and train, not by pipeline. Very expensive way to deliver oil, but there are strategic reasons why the Chinese want to do that. Go ahead to 2030. This is what the projections look like, and of course they could be, they could, uh, be different, but this is based on the, the Department of Energy's exp exp expectations. Japan has actually reduced its, um, its dependency on uh, Middle East oil for a whole host of reasons. The Chinese dependency has grown dramatically, as has India's, and now you see a, a, a thicker line of oil going from Central Asia into China, but this time by pipeline. So there are pipelines being built that will make China oil supplies from the Middle East and the Caspian region less vulnerable to maritime threats, which they do worry about. Now, the same thing is pretty much the case with gas. These are the figures for 2004, Japan getting the bulk, with China and India small quantities. Move ahead to 2013. Again, it's a projection uh, that may change, but two important factors. China, more than anyone else, and increasing amounts of Chinese gas itself coming by pipeline. So, even though the pipeline structure in Central Asia is growing and is very important, it does not in any way uh, substitute for the growing importance of the maritime traffic that we're going to see, not just for oil and gas, but for every other conceivable good except uh, humans and diamonds that tend, that tend to go by air. And there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a parallel increase in, in air traffic as well, which we'll come to in a moment. Let me talk about two countries in particular, uh, because they really are key to this thesis. India. Now, in, in, in discussions about the Middle East and Asia, I would say 90% of the lectures you go to or, or the statements you hear are about China. China's growing role uh, in the Middle East. What does this mean? Are they going to replace us? In fact, my thesis is that India may be more important um, than China. And the reason, well, there are many reasons, but one reason is geography. They're, they're next door. It, it's less than a thousand miles from Mumbai to Muscat. And if you think back to when India, including Pakistan, Bangladesh, were part of British India, the, 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 the Middle East, the Gulf part of the Middle East at least, was run out of India. The Indian army, which included, of course, what today would be considered Pakistanis, fought uh, in, in both World War I and World War II Hundreds of thousands of, of troops volunteered. In World War II, remember, it was Indian troops who put down uprisings in Syria and in Iraq and invaded Iran in August of 1941 uh, under British command, of course, with the Russians. So the joint Anglo-Soviet invasion of Iran, the British side of it done primarily with Indian troops. So they've been there, done that. Um, the Chinese were last uh, uh, in this region in a major, uh, you know, physical military way in the 15th century, and then they opted out. Now they're coming back. Um, the other important geographical point is that because India is so close, there has been a lot of discussion about bringing energy, which they need a lot of, as you can see from those previous charts, from the Middle East directly by pipeline. And there's been this most controversial project, which is still on, on the drawing boards, it's, it's not gotten off the drawing boards, to connect uh, Iran's untapped oil uh, gas reserves to Pakistan and then to India. Now, for this to work, you need cooperation of India and Pakistan, you need to have an Iranian government that's prepared to sign a reasonable deal, and it's very difficult to do this if the United States is bitterly opposed to it, which it is. So this isn't happening yet, but 
in the future, were there to be any change in the Iranian regime, were India and Pakistan to finally resolve their problems, it's a natural. It's a natural. And of course, the other great thing about the Asian, the South Asian, but particularly the Indian presence in the Middle East and the Gulf in particular, is the number of people working there. No one knows the exact numbers, but it is estimated that there are nearly over six million Indians alone. And anyone, and see two thirds of you already been uh, to the Gulf, know that everyone from the guy that checks you in at the hotel, to the people that serve you in the bars, to the people that cut your hair, to the, uh, the schools, the banks, the education system, it's all done by Asian work, Asian labor. Think of it this way. You have this richest, this richest area in the world, uh, the Arab Gulf, dependent upon Asian labor and the U.S. fleet. You take those two out, take the Asian labor out and the American fleet away, and these small little countries would not last very long, in my judgment. They would be totally vulnerable to their neighbors. One theme in this book, that is stressed perhaps ad nauseam is that you really can't understand the growing connections between Asia and the Middle East or West Asia as a lot of the Asians call it unless you look at what infrastructure projects are being built including infrastructure projects within the major countries. Now for instance anyone that is uh, oh, 10 years ago went to India one of the most terrifying experiences of your life was to go on the roads. They are now spending an enormous amount of money trying to improve the road system, including this quadrilateral expressway, which is, which is a magnificent project. It's, it's way behind what the Chinese are doing, but in comparison to what India had in the past, it's a huge success. And, you know, it does connect in parts of India uh, more easily and makes the export of goods and services much simpler and cheaper. Now, let's turn to China. Um, this map's a little tiny, and you probably can't see it from back there, but essentially what this map shows is a, is a number of the major Chinese projects that, are mo that show it moving into Southwest Asia, first and foremost by expanding into its own west. The Chinese... Um, expansion into its western regions is, has, been, has been compared to the American westward expansion in the 19th century. Huge underpopulated area, there are some areas of population that are a nuisance to the Chinese, but nevertheless opening up of the Chinese west then on into Central Asia over the next 50 years will give China direct access, not just to Central Asia, but ultimately uh, to the Gulf itself. And this, of course, has it, it great economic um, implications, particularly if a lot of the trans-Euro uh, Central Asian projects are completed also, which is designed to connect Europe to, to the Caspian and Central Asia. You may soon be able to, when I say soon, in 20, 30 years, you may be able to go by train um, all the way from China to London, um, particularly given this new train uh, link between uh, Azerbaijan and Turkey and this new tunnel they're putting underneath the Bosphorus. So the, the logistical dimensions of this story, I think, are, are terribly important.